So I am a huge Star Wars fan. Like many people my age, I was introduced to the franchise via the prequels. Well, that's technically a lie. See, it wasn't the movies that got me into it, but the 2003 Clone Wars animated miniseries by the legendary animator Gendy Tartakovsky, who you may know for stuff like Dexter's Laboratory, Samurai Jack, and Primal. Now, of course, the action and characters got me in, but what really caught my attention were the clone troopers. These guys were so awesome as to portray the super cool badasses taking on hordes of battle droids. Not to mention games like the original Star Wars Battlefront 2 and Republic Commando showing up how awesome these guys were. With the former focusing on the perspective of the regular clones, and the latter featuring this elite commando unit. Not to mention, in the comics there was ARC Trooper Alpha 17's no-nonsense suit first, ask questions later attitude was just so cool to me. We could end this quickly if you only listen to my advice. We are not assassinating every surviving political leader on this planet. You're just going to end up killing them, eventually. Oh my god, he's so goddamn cool! So imagine my shock when I found out these guys became the villain's henchmen. Which just shows how much of a stupid kid I was. I mean, it was hinted at before. Not to mention, these guys are the predecessors to Stormtroopers, so it was pretty obvious. Well, I thought it was obvious. And of course, with the release of the 2008 Clone Wars TV show, it helped humanize the clones and they became a beloved part of the Star Wars universe. However, there was something I had noticed upon my many rewatches, and that was the clones' live action actors including their donors, Django and Boba Fett. Daniel Logan, Bo Taylor, and especially Tamora Morrison all have something in common. They're all Maui, or at least have some kind of Maui ancestry, thus making the clones that as well. For those who don't know, the Maui are the indigenous people of New Zealand. Ah, New Zealand, the forgotten son of the Anglosphere. Usually overshadowed by its larger neighbor Australia, and in fact some people believe that New Zealand is a part of Australia. It's not. Anyway, the Maui are a Polynesian Pacific Islander people, similar to the Samoans and Native Hawaiians. The Maui were first come to New Zealand during the 1300s, which was uninhabited at the time. Here they would set up various different tribes and their own societies. They also hunted this giant bird known as a moa to extinction, which on one hand is sad because, you know, humans hunting an animal to extinction. But then again, if this 12-foot bird was still around, it would be terrifying. However, for better or worse, the Maui were best known for being a warrior people, with their reputation for being brutal in combat and resorting to cannibalism to their defeated foes. In fact, some of you might be familiar with the Haka, the traditional Maori war dance that put fear into their enemies. But Maori society was more than just fighting and eating people as they had their own languages, mythology, and cultural structures. Anyway, around the 1600s, Europeans come into New Zealand and you can guess where this is going. At first, peaceful trade, war, ceasefire, disease, and then subjugation. It's your typical colonization story for many indigenous peoples around the world. With the clones Maori origin, I wanted to talk about a specific group of soldiers who fought in World War II who were one of the most decorated units of the war, the 28th Maori Battalion. These men fought with bravery for a country that didn't really care much for them. Yeah, I know I already did this topic already, but this is for a different marginalized group in another country. And I'm going to keep expanding on that kind of topic. But with so many clone units out there, I decided to focus on the 501st Battalion, since that is the most well-known of the clone unit. I'm also going to be mentioning the 212th Attack Battalion, since whenever the 501st appear, they're usually fighting alongside them. I mean, sure, I could have added them to the title, but one, it would have been too long, and two, the 212th doesn't have the same name recognition compared to the 501st. But the point of this video is to basically compare and contrast these units in their stories, both fiction and reality. And to showcase a piece of history that, of course, has been buried. And to disappoint the Expanded Universe fans, for the Star Wars section of this video, I am mainly going to be talking about the Disney canon since it will make things more simple. But don't worry, I will make some Legends references here and there. But without further ado, I think it's time to focus on these troopers. So the 501st Battalion was a clone unit in the Grand Army of the Republic. They would first see combat during the Battle of Geonosis, which was the first battle of the Clone Wars where they fought against the Separatist droid army. My first day as a member of the 501st. It was hot, it was sandy, chaotic. Nothing at all like the simulations on Kamino. 
Of course, that's pretty much the way it was for all of us, wasn't it? All that breeding, all those years of training doesn't really prepare you for all the screaming or the blood, does it? Frankly, I'm still amazed we ever made it through the first hour, never mind the first day. Incredibly, the 501st survived the crucible of Geonosis, emerging battle-hardened and ready for whatever the war would throw it up. After the battle, the 501st would prove themselves as one of the finest units of the clone army. Here they would be under the command of Jedi General Anakin Skywalker, his student Ahsoka Tano, and their commanding officer, Captain Rex. Along the way, they would be attached with a 212 attack battalion led by Obi-Wan Kenobi and Commander Cody, which was a part of the larger 7th Sky Corps, which was also led by Obi-Wan. The 501st and 212 would get the best and worst of the war, from the hellish jungles of Felucia, to the snowy planet of Orta Pluta, to defending their home planet of Kamino from Separatist forces. During the Battle of Ryloth, the 501st would spearhead against the blockade and it would be the 212 that would go on to liberate the Twi'lek people from Separatist oppression. Over time, the two units would color their armor in the respect of their commanding officers, with the 501st going with their iconic blue markings in honor of Captain Rex, while the 212 would go for a more gold coloring which was used by Commander Cody. The clone troopers would also develop their own personalities showing that despite being clones, they are individuals, with them customizing their armor, getting tattoos, and different hairstyles. However, one of the 501st's biggest challenges would be the Battle of Umbara. Here they would face off against local resistance that made things very difficult for them as they used an environment and weapons that many of the clones were not familiar with. It didn't have that during the battle, Anakin Skywalker was replaced by another Jedi General by the name of Pong Krell. Unlike Anakin who encouraged individuality and free thinking from his troops, Pong Krell demanded complete obedience and would talk down to the clones. I find it very interesting, Captain, that you are able to recognize the value of honor for a clone. Krell's hatred for the clones can be seen as an allegory for racism as he sees the clones as not being human due to how they were born. Even though this guy's not human himself, but whatever, bigotry doesn't really make any sense. But unfortunately, Krell isn't the only one with these ideals as, despite fighting for the Republic, clones didn't have any rights as they couldn't vote or at the beginning of the war interact with the population, and many politicians and Jedi were okay with them dying on the battlefield. While we do see Jedi who do care for their clone troopers, they were more the exception than the norm. And under Krell's command, the casualty rate among the 501st would be at its highest. And those that disobeyed orders or thought outside the box would be threatened with execution. And this will keep going on until there was a friendly fire incident between the 501st and the 212. As they believed that they were Umbarans disguised as each other. However, it was then revealed that the whole incident was orchestrated by Krell himself as he was a double agent for the Separatists and Sith. For this portrayal, Crow was executed, and many clones would wonder, what was this all for? What's the point of all this? I mean, why? I don't know, sir. I don't think anybody knows. But I do know that someday, this war is gonna end. Then what? We're soldiers. What happens to us then? Later on, during one of the battles, a 501st member by the name of Tup would lose his mind and shoot a Jedi. It is then revealed that his inhibitor ship has malfunctioned. The purpose of these chips were to mind control clones to kill the Jedi. When another 501st member by the name of Five starts to expose this truth, he is killed before he can reveal it to the public. Throughout the last days of the war, the 501st and 212 will be stretched out thin and put on the various battlefields and planets such as Megiddo, Yerbana, and Kashyyyk, where they return the tide of these battles and liberate the locals. All the while, a sect of the 501st called the 302nd Division would help Ahsoka Tano track down and capture the Sith Lord Darth Maul on the planet of Mandalore where he has taken control. Now, for those who only watch movies, you may be asking, how did Maul survive? Which I reply, go watch Clone Wars, they explain it there. Meanwhile, the 212 Attack Battalion and another section of the 501st will lead the charge in the Battle of Utapau to capture and or kill the Separatist droid leader General Grievous. Unfortunately for the 501st and 212, they would turn from heroes to villains when Emperor Palpatine gave the infamous Order 66. The mind control chips kicked in and they, along with the newly appointed Darth Vader, would go into the Jedi Temple and kill any Jedi on sight. Even the 501st soldiers would turn against Ahsoka, who wasn't actually a Jedi at the time. Long story. That being said, she was able to save Captain Rex, but the rest were not so fortunate. And of course, the 212 would betray Obi-Wan, almost killing him, but because he is the master of the high ground, he survives. After the war, the clones would be used as a police force to guard the new Empire. But eventually, they would be seen as expensive and useless as the Empire would begin to replace them with non-clone human recruits, 
who would become Stormtroopers. The 501st Battalion would end up becoming the 501st Legion and would be placed under the command of Darth Vader, where they would subjugate the galaxy earning the nickname Vader's Fist. Even the Empire would destroy the clone's home planet of Kamino. Many clones felt anger and betrayal as they felt that all their fighting was meant for nothing. Now some senators, such as one of my many blue waifus, Rio Chuchu, would try to fight for clone rights, but in the end, many clones would be abandoned by the Empire, with some even being imprisoned and tortured by them. While there were clones such as Captain Rex who would go on the fight for the Rebellion, meanwhile, Commander Cody would try at first work for the Empire, but soon realize what he was doing was wrong and would desert. The 501st and to an extent the 212 battalions were some of the most decorated units of the Clone Wars. Despite their tragic end, their actions are what made them the best. When Germany invaded Poland in September 1939 starting the Second World War in Europe, the United Kingdom declared war on Germany. And by declaring war, they brought along their colonies and Commonwealth states to the fight as well. Now, the white-dominated countries like Canada and Australia were on board. Well, except Ireland, they just said, screw you, we're not fighting. And the non-white ones were just kind of forced into it. But New Zealand was more in the former category as many Kiwis enlisted in the military. However, in the Maori community, there was a split. Some seeing it as a white man's war and wanted nothing to do with the conflict. It didn't help that the Maori had a complicated relationship with the British military as the colonization of the island was still fresh in their memories. It didn't help that the Maori were banned from joining the military until the First World War. And even then, many were regulated to medial and support tasks such as digging trenches and transporting supplies. But on the other hand, many Maori leaders felt that this was a chance to prove themselves and that they would give them more rights and freedom. Now, this was a very common thought among colored soldiers and generals such as the African American soldiers in the US military or the Indian soldiers that fought for the British. Now, whether it's a good kind of thought, I'll leave that up to you. So in January 1940, the 28th Maori Battalion would be formed. Like a lot of colored troops at the time, the Maori Battalion would be led by white officers. Because, God forbid, those darkies can lead themselves. The battalion's motto would be Ake, Ake, Kiakaha E, or Upwards, Upwards, Be Strong. In May 1940, the Maori Battalion would be shipped out. However, the first enemy wouldn't be Nazi Germany, but apartheid South Africa. You see, when the New Zealand troops were briefly stationed in South Africa, the white soldiers can get into the country but the Maori were forced to stay on the ship due to the country's racial segregation laws. As you can imagine, the Maori were rightfully angered by this. So the British, New Zealand, and South African authorities, feeling some kind of pity for them and not wanting to risk a mutiny, allowed them to go into Cape Town for one hour. And they were told they had to be on their best behavior. Aren't they quite generous? See, this is why I don't believe in the whole good versus evil narrative of World War II. All the major players were just racist, imperialistic, genocidal monsters. In July 1940, the Maori Battalion would be shut off to Scotland where they would actually receive a warmer welcome. Here they would prepare for the German invasion of the United Kingdom, as the British suffered a humiliating defeat at the Battle of France. And the French themselves? Well, let's just say they're going to be the butt of many surrender jokes for years to come. Anyway, the 28th would wait into the UK until the Germans were being back after the Battle of Britain. In April 1941, they'd be transferred to Greece. You see, in October 1940, Nazi Germany's ally, Fascist Italy, wanted to get on the action. So they invaded Greece because they thought it would be an easy target. And well, it was not. The Greeks actually proved to be more capable than expected and managed to beat the Italians, even pushing them out of their country. So annoyed and embarrassed by this, the Germans came down to save the Italians. So in response, the British and the Commonwealth would go out to help the Greeks. This is where the Maori Battalion would get their first hits of combat, and it was a total disaster. Despite the Maori fighting bravely, the Axis forces outnumbered the Allies to the one. Not to mention, many of the Germans were experienced combatants from battles such as France, Norway, and Poland. So the British and Commonwealth troops were pushed out of Greece, thus leaving it to its fate. Here the 20th would go and regroup in Egypt and be part of the North African campaign. Here they would get their first victory by taking on Italian forces and getting thousands of prisoners. Yeah, like with Greece, the Italians thought they could take over North Africa and failed, so the Germans had to bail them out again. However, unlike Greece, the Maori actually would prove themselves to be a capable fighting force. Here the Maori battalion would use brutal combat techniques like bayonet charges to take the Germans head on. And it's reported that their haka dances was enough to put the fear into the Nazis. This would gain them a reputation from the Germans as strong fighters. However, there was also some racist elements to this reputation. I mean, okay, they're Nazis, who doesn't have a racist reputation with them? 
But the Germans viewed the Maori as savages. Many German soldiers feared that if they were taken prisoner by the Maori, they would be eaten by them. In fact, the Germans even gave the Maori a nickname, Scalp Hunters. Now, if you are familiar with the Maori Battalion, you probably want me to talk about their thoughts given to them by Erwin Rommel. For those who don't know, Rommel was a famous German general who was responsible for the planning of the invasions of France and North Africa. He's also been whitewashed throughout history to be the quote-unquote good guy among the Nazis, but that's a different story there. Anyway, Rommel was once quoted to say, Give me the Maori Battalion and I will conquer the world. But the thing is, Rommel never said that. But the real person that quote is attributed to is General Siegfried Westphal, who was Rommel's chief of staff. And he said it at a war reunion during the 1970s. But I can see why the mix-up happened. I mean, after all, what's more impressive? The fearsome enemy general complimenting you, or his second-in-command that no one has ever heard of? During the Second Battle of El Alamein, the Maori Battalion were crucial in turning the tide of the battle. And in May 1943, the Axis were finally kicked out of Africa. Due to their impressive combat record, Maori officers were finally allowed to lead their own men, thus phasing out the white ones. Throughout the rest of the summer of 1943, the battalion would earn a well-deserved rest until October of that year, they would be called again to fight in Italy. I mentioned this before, but I always considered the Italian front of World War II to be the dumping ground for both sides. As soldiers from all races and nationalities would be found there, the misfits and outcasts that no one wanted. The Germans saw the Italian campaign as a buffer zone to keep the Americans and British at bay while keeping up their dying Italian ally. Yeah, I think you can take a good guess what the relationship was like between Italy and Germany during the war. While at first the Allies thought Italy would be easy, they soon realized how difficult it would be and just used it as a distraction for the Germans while everyone focused on the Western and Eastern fronts. Like many Allied troops, the Maori would slowly move their way up the Italian peninsula as the stubborn German defense along with the rough Italian terrain were proved to be a challenge for them. Their biggest challenge would be the Battle of Monte Cassino, which was for five months during early 1944, the Germans would dig deep into the mountains and old monasteries that was on the top of it. The Maori Battalion tried many attempts to take Monte Cassino, but each time they would fail and be forced back. Despite their best efforts, the 20th could not achieve their goal, and in the end, it was actually Polish troops that took down the Germans at Monte Cassino. Now this might sound like a ripoff for the Maoris, but if you know anything about Poland during this time period, they really need this win. Because if the 20th would try to recover it in July 1944, they would be instrumental in the liberation of Florence and would later take the city of Faenza. During the winter of 1944-1945, the Maori Battalion would take a more defensive role as they would defend their position from German advancement. In April, the Maori Battalion, would, along with the rest of the New Zealand forces, would finally make it up to northern Italy and they would begin to take town after town away from the Germans until May 2nd, 1945, they finally reached the town of Treste, where the Germans would surrender. Five days later, Germany would surrender in general, ending the war in Europe. Now, there was a brief standoff where the Maori Battalion almost fought communist Yugoslav partisans over a border dispute, but the situation was later settled. The Maori Battalion can finally breathe easily, though they were told they would soon be reassigned to fight the Japanese in the Pacific, However, on August 15, 1945, Japan surrendered, thus ending the Second World War. Now, there would be a section of the Maori Battalion who would be a part of the British sector of the Allied occupation of Japan, but aside from that, the men of the 28th Battalion would be allowed to go back home. Haida would be welcomed as heroes and would go back to their lives. After the war, many Maori would move into the cities, and while they did enjoy some factors of New Zealand life, many would still face the same racism and discrimination. Not to mention, many of the veterans along with their children would start to lose their cultural roots and languages. So for many, there were too Maori to be white and too white to be Maori. This led to alienation among some of them in the early 1970s, inspired by the civil rights movement in the United States. This would lead to the Maori Renaissance and protest movement, where many Maori would reconnect to their cultural heritage and demanded better rights from the New Zealand government. The 28th Maori Battalion was considered one of the most decorated units of the war and proved themselves on the battlefield that they were just as capable, if not better, than their white counterparts. I don't know if this was intentional on George Lucas' part, but by making the clones Maori, it helps showcase a people who are wildly unknown outside of their country of origin, and by making a connection to a unit of indigenous soldiers who again have been mostly forgotten. While the clone troopers will always still appear in future Star Wars stories to come, it was actually quite nice to go into their ethnic origins. I guess you can say inclusion, all I can say is Ake Ake Kyakaha E.